Testing. Now you can hear me, I think, right? That was super weird. All right, we'll come. So I, I turned off mute and I knew it had been working earlier and then apparently it looked like I turned off mute, but I didn't, I don't know. There's always gotta be something, right? I mean, this is the show where there always has to be something. Uh, and hopefully the sound is remotely matching up to the video. I, I keep trying to find a way to do the face camera so that there aren't lights in it and I just give up and the lights are important for you to be able to see the miniatures. So let's see, we've got Curse13 who's excited about stealing stuff. Um, Quindy, uh, Jedi Jared, I am Turjan. Thank you all for coming. Um, sorry, I got distracted. So yes, I am going to talk today about stealing stuff. Oh, and there's Bob and Julie and Kira Nico. Um, but for just a brief catch up on what we did last week in case you missed it and you want to go watch it on the video on demand. I had fun mixing colors with, from the uh, paints in the Learn to Paint kit set. So I used the paints from both sets and we talked a bit about, um, you know, how to mix highlights for reds and greens, uh, how to mix different kinds of greens other than the ones you get in the kit how to dull colors down, stuff like that. I'm sure that I will be talking more about color mixing at some time in the future or more than one time, but um, I know it is a challenging subject for a lot of people. So if, if it is for you, you might want to go look at last week's show. Hi, Rings Raccoon. Uh, this, week's show, this week's show is also about color, but in a different way. But before that, I thought I would just share, I can't share one of the things I'm working on because Ron, reserves the right to tease you all uh, so I cannot take that from him um, but this is the other thing that what kind of if I only have a few minutes because this is such a small little guy where is my Sir four scale so this is chop from chops something house. Anyway, it's a Brindwind uh, restaurant run by all like halflings and dwarves and stuff like that. So uh, these were characters that were released with ReaperCon, but they're freely available to everyone. And I am painting up Chop and... Oh, I hit my light. I'm painting up Chop and Grub. And so far I've only started on Chop. Um, so my plan is to kind of, I'm trying to work on my my own uh, problems that I keep advising other people about. I don't know if you know that a lot of what I write on my blog is uh, related to issues that I am still struggling with. And that one of them is having focus and, and having enough pop. So my plan is to make the kerchief a bright color so that helps draw attention up to the face. And you can see on the little feet wraps that I did not really highlight those up very much because that is not a center of attention. I did give some attention to the fur on his feet because that is like an important characteristic of a halfling. You guys can probably guess like the general subject area of the thing that I cannot tease about. Um, given the time of year, you know, there's a big clue for you. Uh, let's see if I have anything else to show or talk about before we get started. Just giving people a chance to wander in. So it sounds like people got notifications this week. Because I know we had someone who didn't get a notification last week. And then when I looked at my own meal, email after the show, I didn't get any um, notification either. So I don't know what happened last week. But there you go. Kurinico, it might be something like Christmas. It might be. Um... All right, so I wanted to talk about color schemes because, you know, give me give me a, a bird with a brush emoji in the chat if thinking of color schemes is sometimes very challenging for you. And just pretend I put one in that I can have time to type from that because sometimes it is very challenging for me. And so where, where can we get color schemes? And it's pretty obvious to think about taking them from miniatures. I've certainly seen um, people, you know, when I, when there are, paint jobs that are up in the store. I've seen people kind of do versions of those and that's cool. I'm glad that people found them helpful. So I think we all already know to steal from each other. Um, <laughs> yes, that's true. You can put more emojis in the more horrible this part of painting is for you. So you can give it on a scale from slightly annoying to, oh my God, I hate this so much. Um, oh, and congratulations to Carrie Michael Cosby on uh, placing first in the... Um, 
Sugar Skull competition. I, I loved your entry. I loved so many of the entries. I mean, they were really great. Hi, Julia Trent. Wow, Puri Nico really, really not loving the picking colors. Uh, so obviously one, one way is to steal from other people's miniatures and you guys already probably know that one, so I'm not gonna get into that today. Although there is this concept of making a master study where you try to like copy, like you don't just take the colors, you try to copy what the other person did. That is something worth talking about, but that's for another day. I'll put this away for now. But what are other things you can steal from? So um, I'm sure you all probably think of stuff like this. Like you, you've got covers from your favorite novels or you get art books like this. Let's just randomly open this up somewhere. Um, so, you know, I could, I could do a mage with uh, a silver metallic staff and, and red and salmon and cream colored clothing. And that would be a color scheme. And Jernico is right that using your color wheel is also very helpful. Um, but some people, you know, we were talking about this last week with the color wheel. If you're, if you're still getting familiar with colors and you think to yourself, well, I don't, I don't, this is like a thief or something. I don't want to paint them like bright yellow green and bright blue and bright red orange like that. That doesn't seem right. Um, whereas what you would do is use these. Uh, kind of duller colors that we talked a bit about last week. So yes, it, let's just briefly go over the color wheel because it is a handy way to find color schemes. And that's what this stuff in the middle is. I don't think we talked about that last week. Um, so in this case, if I did want to paint something yellow orange or um, you know one of these more neutral versions of that, the complement is blue violet. So that would be a very simple color scheme is just two colors and that's kind of hard to do. Plus you get neutral. So you get like some grays or tan or white, stuff like that. Um, a triadic color scheme is actually one of my favorites. So I like to do kind of twists on it, but uh, let's see, I like to do red, orange, blue, violet, and green is one that I do a lot. And I do one with purple though too. Let's go more to purple and see what we get. Yeah, purple, purple, green, orange is one of my favorites. So basically the three primary colors are a triad and the three secondary colors are a triad if you want kind of the easy versions. And again, that's any color within there and you don't use equal versions. In fact, not only do you not have to use equal versions, it is better to not use equal amounts of each color. Um, you want to kind of have one as a main color, one as, you know, in a smaller area and the one that's just kind of like a little accent color. And you don't even always have to be like all of these colors are super apparent on the figure. Um, like I might paint somebody with a purple dress and then make them a red head. And well, actually let's say I do a green dress, make them a red head. And then I use purple in the shadows of both of these colors. So it's not obvious, but it's still there. Then the other one, which if you're feeling like, okay, my guy's got like a lot of stuff on it. Let's zoom in even more is there are two called tetrads and essentially they are pairs of complements. So it's just, you can draw the rectangle in two different ways. So you, you get, you know, a square of things. You get two pairs of complements. That's four colors. Again, you don't want to have them all equally represented. That's a case where maybe especially you want, okay, did the violet is just my shadow and you only see the orange and the yellow orange and the blue green something like that. So these are handy. There's a lot of books. I, so a couple years ago, we did some renovation in our house. So we packed up all the stuff, including my paint room and all my art books. Um, and then we had a flood in the room where we put all the packed stuff. So we had friends come over and they helped us out. It wasn't a huge flood. It was just a little bit on the ground, but most of the books have been packed in cardboard boxes. I got from liquor store cause those are free. Uh, and they take heavy things very well. So there was like emergency shuffling of the books to other containers and I've found a lot of them and unpacked them, but the ones I haven't found are kind of my color scheme books. So I want to show you guys those, but I haven't found them yet. Because they make books for designers and there's online things where you can find, it's kind of like an online version of this and let's say you know you want blue violet. And then it'll just fill in, you know, you put your color in and you say like, okay, I want this color on my miniature for sure. And you put that in and you say, I want a triadic scheme and it'll show you other colors that would do that or a tetrad scheme and it'll show you other colors that will do that. 
Uh, I am forgetting the name of any links right now, but there, there are definitely sites on the web that do that. But another thing you can steal from, and that, so that is stealing from people who, apologies, I'll fix this for the OCD amongst us. Um, that is a way of uh, stealing from people who know what they're doing, people who put books together of these are color schemes that you can use. Um, but while we tend to think of fantasy movies and books and stuff like that as our first go-to, don't, uh, War Shadow 55 says the paint rack app has a color wheel tool as well if you buy the app. Um, and I should be able to, what, one of the names of one of the online things is just color or something. If you put in color scheme online or color picker online, you will find all kinds of links to apps and online web pages that do that. Um, but you can also steal from people who do design. Now, I'm not necessarily steal, saying steal this. I'm actually, this is, this is a different story. So before I went to ReaperCon, I bought this and it was like 80 cough drops. Cause you guys, if you've been watching, you know I have a cough problem. And in fact, fully expect me to have to have one of these during the show. Cause I just accept that that's how it works now. So I bought 80 of these and I'm like, well, that's just way too many. I probably won't use them all before they go bad. But the way things have been going, yes, I will. But so this is packaging design. I don't actually have a great package with me. This is a fairly plain one, but it does give you a color scheme right there. You've got a dark blue, um, a lighter and more vivid blue. That's almost like a little bit of a cyan, but green and then white as an accent color. There you go. There's a color scheme. And then if you really wanted, you could have gold or like blonde hair or something to be the part that really stands out. Uh, so, and I have painted things where I've stolen from package design. But uh, a few weeks ago, I got this in the mail. Uh, it was a flyer and I was, you know, I was just gonna throw it straight to a stripling and then something about it caught my eye. And I really liked this. So this is, these people, the people who make packaging, the people who put together, you know, de room designs for, you know, like if you go to the uh, hardware store and you start looking at the paint samples, they'll have brochures where they're like showing you a whole room design where they're like, here's what trim color you use and here's what color you use on the walls and here's what color you use on like the cupboards if it was your kitchen. Those people are highly trained and well paid to know how to pick colors. So let's, let's hop on their backs and borrow that information. And I thought this was a really nice version of like a fall autumn feeling color scheme that wasn't just, you know, rusty red, yellow, oranges, like all those colors, we, the, the colors that leaves are, that are very commonly what we will jump to for an autumn color scheme. So it does, it does have like the orange, but it has some other things that kind of mix it up. And I liked that idea. And I thought, well, what if we did, what if I paint a figure on the show using these, but I'm also going to kind of go through the process of, okay, so I have this picture, but where do I go from here? So where I went from there is I went to my paint rack and I started looking at my paints and this is where yeah, I prepped these for the, the show now. Actually, I use them for uh, projects too. So if you're painting multiple figures at a time, this is a handy way of, you know, save your fig your paints that you're using on one figure in a little storage container and put that to the side. If you have to, you know, change and work on another figure, you have to clean up your desk or whatever. I found this very handy. So I bought these to organize my desk drawers and then I had a bunch left over because I bought too many. And I started using from this and I find it very handy. So, um, I'll, I'll kind of go through what I did first and then where you may get some complications. So I was looking at them and my thought was, okay, this is kind of a skin color. Um, these would be great for like equipment or clothing. This could even be a metallic color. It doesn't have to be, it could be, um, you know, another color on the thing and I just use a more neutral metallic. And then when I start thinking like, well, what figure could I do this on? that I had close to hand and I ended up picking this guy who I kept the thing this time. So this is Elanter, the Lost Prince. He was one of the figures of the month a few months back. And uh, I believe Michael Proctor painted the store copy and he is in the Bones USA. So last night I just um, scraped off some of the mold lines and tossed him in some um, isopropyl alcohol and he should be ready to paint. Because as you know, 
Hi, Valander. Oh, while you're here, I just wanted to say that when I was finishing up, so I am finished this project now. That's one reason I was able to do this so easily. Um, but I had not yet got to my Aoki Steel last show, and when I got there, it was in pretty bad shape, which is surprising considering that that's a relatively new paint. So I don't know what's in there that makes that one go off quickly. I think I was able to rescue it, but it was pretty much on the cusp of uh, not being usable anymore. So there's just something about that one, I guess. So you're not alone, Valander. I like the Bonds USA too. Um, and Chris said, for being a Lost Princess guy, shows up everywhere. Uh, so my thought was, this uh, light color could be his hair. It could be like sort of platinum, blonde, almost white. Now I, I'm not gonna make it as light as that probably. So this would be his skin color, this would be his hair color. I was thinking this for the cloak and this for, um, his robe, dress, jerkin, I don't know what we want to call it. Now I still have to figure out all the accessories. So those are probably going to be more neutral colors. I mean, I can reuse that um, orange color on this, uh, um, and now I'm blanking, quiver. Uh, <laughs> and then I checked around to see if I had a metallic, I thought matched this color. So what I started doing was using my physical swatches and I do recommend this. So you could also like eyeball some stuff and then sit down and put paint on it. And I'm going to show how you would do that later. I've done that before too. Um, but since I had the colors on the paints, I started kind of that way. So I think that's a little similar to the skin, you know, it's pinky, but not super pink. And then that, that's a bit darker, but if I mix those two together, that would kind of be this, this pillow is actually sort of two colors. The bottom is a more different color than the top th than is true of the rest of the pillows. Hold on, I have to fix my light. Um, so I think that's a pretty good match. We'll test it in a minute. Uh, and then, well, no, that's for later. So then this light color, oops. I thought that Osiren Sand looked pretty close. So in a minute, we'll test how close did I get. Um, and then I pick like this one out for shadows and stuff for this color. I thought it's, it's interesting that several of these are past minor colors. That's just a weird coincidence that they happen to be the ones that match. I think that's a pretty close match to the mid-tone color. So basically I'm trying to match the, um, the middle color. So there's shadows and highlights on these, just like there would be on our miniatures. And I'm just looking for kind of what's, what's the one most in the middle pieces of eight was one of the, um, Rubicon colors last year, I think. Uh, and I thought it might work pretty well. Now it's a bit darker than this. It's a bit more of the shadow colors. And I did forget to go get a highlight for that, but I doubt I'm gonna get to the metallics today anyway. Um, and then for the green, my initial thought was ancient oak, although I think it's a little duller. And then uh, I realized I didn't have elven green on my shelf when I first looked. And I don't know if that's a little too saturated, but I figure if I mix those two together, that's probably that. So to really test that, I would apply paints on here. Now I only have one of these um, pictures because they only sent me one catalog and that's the only part I kept. But uh, I also want to talk about if you're looking for stuff online. So online pictures look different. Now, I don't know how to show you both of these at the same time. And honestly, it doesn't matter because you're looking at this online. So you're still not going to experience it the same way. But I'm going to go to my um, image directory for a while. So I took a photo um, with my phone. I think this is the photo with my phone of, of this so that I could um, do eyedropper on it. So it might be hard for you. It's like, OK, well, what are those colors? Like I'm eyeballing this. And I'm not like super practiced at this, but I am a little, you know, since I've been practicing or studying traditional art for like six years now, I've gotten better at color than I was, you know, certainly when I started painting miniatures, but even like, you know, seven or eight years ago painting miniatures, cause I've been matching colors in different ways. So I'm like, not the best, I'm not Anne who can probably, you know, you could probably show her this, this uh, flyer and she would get those exact colors and be able to mix them just from basic colors. I'm not, I'm not there yet, but I'm getting a little better, but maybe you're not, maybe you're where I was some years ago. Uh, so what you can do that's very helpful is use a computer program with the, so you get an eyedropper and you go over like, so the column on the far left, that was me going over like the lightest section 
of each spot on the pillows. And then the two in the middle are, I go over the um, mid-tones. I try to find some of the mid-tones. And for those, I generally do look at a couple of different spots because the lighting can make a difference. You can see it in some of these, you know, the, the silver pillow, there's not a lot of difference between the two mid-tones. There's a little more difference on the bottom half of the skin color pillow. Um, and you may also see something interesting in that, so that pillow that I said was yellow, when you pull the colors out, it's not yellow. And I assume that's because of the situation where color is relative. And this is where you may have run into trouble when you've tried to steal color schemes before. The colors around things are always going to affect your perception of individual colors. Even if you know what you're doing, or even halfway know what you're doing the way I do. So I got that wrong. I mean, I picked out tans and yellows and when I color dropped it, it was green. So then I thought to myself, well, is the color on my phone off? Should I try doing a scan instead? Cause I think my scanner is pretty close to true color. People are stealing to saying in the chat to uh, steal color schemes from colorful sea slugs and uh, Mantis shrimps. Yeah, you will get a very, <laughs> you will get a very colorful figure with mantis shrimps. Valander says, I would only pick mantis shrimps if I wanted to use every one of the 260 Reaper paints I own. So then I scanned the uh, pillow picture and it, I, I should have put these two right next to each other, but I didn't. Well, okay, there you can see. So if you look at the ground under the pillows, see it looks kind of gray there and then it looks more white there, which is truer to the advertisement. So I think this is a truer color version of the colors. But interestingly, some of the um, colors I picked are closer to the way my camera saw it. I don't know. But then I did the color picker thing here, and I'm going to show you the comparison of the two. But you can see that that yellow pillow is still not yellow. <laughs> it's still um, kind of like khaki greens. Um, and then the other colors are, are all close, but the, the pink pillow doesn't look nearly as pink. It, like the, the red tones and the pink tones are really subdued in this version. So I'm not 100% if, you know, maybe the color is not as true on this as I think, I don't know. But then I pulled off just the samples. So in each section, the top row is this, the color sampled from the picture I took with my uh, phone. And the bottom row is sampled from the pictures I scanned on a scanner. Uh, so they're similar. I mean, they're in the same color families. They're not like wildly divergent. Um, but there are some differences too, other than, you know, that yellow continues to be green. So what is the value of doing this? Um, it helps you see colors if you aren't very good at that. But it also gives you something to work with because then you can print that out. So when you're, if you were holding your paint up to the screen, if we pretend this is a screen and I'm doing this, it's going to be a lot harder because the way a screen makes color and the way physical things make color are totally different. Bye, Valander. Thanks for popping in. Um, so I recommend never trying to match colors directly to a screen. Print stuff out. And then you, because you can physically apply the paint to these spots and we'll do a little bit of that. Um, so this is the one off my phone and this is the one that I scanned and this is the combo. And then in some ways I'm going to say it doesn't necessarily make a difference because if my phone shifted the colors in this one, it shifted all the colors. So they're all still relative to each other and should still work as a color scheme. Uh, and the same thing here. If my, if my printer scanner wasn't as precise as I thought it was, and some of the colors are different, they're all gonna be, the color cast is gonna be shifted all in the same way. So it should still be fine to use. Like I don't have to sweat this that much. So that's the first thing is like, use this as a guideline, but don't like stress yourself out about whether you can exactly match the colors. And I don't know that I did, but what would be important to me, I'll test some of them, but what would be important to me is, does it work as a color scheme? So here, I'll get my, Get my thing back and put them in the same order. Maybe we'll go to a slightly different order. So if I put these paints out that I said, these are the mid-tones. And there's the pieces of eight. 
Well, and I was kind of in between these. But yeah, see that? That almost looks too intense. Um, and we'll zoom in a little. Do these colors look like they go together? Because in the end, that's, that's still a color scheme that works. The other question I would ask is, do I have a range of values? So if I turn this to, to um, black and white, which as you know, we can do with this camera. So I'll go ahead and do that in a minute. And I think we do. This is a fairly dark color and I'm actually planning on making it a little darker because it's not quite dark enough. So I would add this in or I would add blue liner in probably. So this, this isn't quite, this is a little lighter than the mid-tone I want. This is a little lighter than the mid-tone I want. But um, this may be even a little lighter than the mid-tone I want. But let's do the test. Because you need to have some darker color and some lighter color to be able to separate the value, or to separate the um, areas on your figure so that it's readable. And if that doesn't make sense, then go look for the episodes where I was like critiquing a blacksmith and a bugbear and then repainting them. And I talk about that a lot more there. So I think we got it. This is very light. This is kind of light, medium. And then if I darken this up a little, this is darker. And then this one is also kind of medium dark. Hey, I'll be, I'll be the Zane. Um, so that's one thing to look for. Oops. I keep touching my lamps, right? This is when we, when we first got these lamps. So we forgot these lamps and they had them for us at events. And at first I didn't like them because I kept touching it with my arm. Um, and I was like the only artist out of everybody who didn't like them. Because I kept touching with my, my arm and changing the thing. And I've gotten a lot better about it, but apparently I'm not perfect. So does anyone have any questions or anything like, like, is what I'm saying making sense so far? Because sometimes I'm not sure. So I'm not going to paint on my actual little sample, but I could do some painting on here. And then in the end, I have to decide, okay, even if I didn't match, does it matter? Or am I okay? Um, you know, do I feel, oops, I keep going the opposite direction. Do I feel like my color scheme works becomes the most important question. And does it, you know, have stuff for all the, the parts of my figure? Uh, Warshadow55 asks, how do you keep a mix of paints from graying out? So are you talking about, you know, if I wanted to mix a shadow from this and then it gets grayer, or I wanted to mix a highlight from this and then it gets grayer? Or are you talking about more if I'm trying to mix this orange, but I keep getting something that seems grayer when I'm using red and yellow? I am Tura John is full of ideas for an art heist. Wow, okay. Um, so I would probably, you know, for just general testing of color schemes, I would probably try to use like a neutral thing like this. Cause if I put, you know, just this, so we, we identified this as one of the, the middle colors with well, this orange, this one. um, if I put this on here, it might look a lot lighter than it actually is. And if I put this on, you know, if I put that on, on white, it's going to look dark until I put the dark color on it. And then everything kind of comes into focus. So if you start with something that's in the middle, it, um, helps you not get distracted by color values, but hold on. I had apologies. If you can hear a very sad cat, my husband closed his doors. Uh, hi Bryce. I, I know that he's asking how to stop desaturation, but I'm not sure in what context, if, if he's trying to mix, are you, but are you talking about it when you're trying to mix shadows and highlights or when you're trying to mix colors together to make other colors? And partly I would say, watch the show last week. Cause it, so if you're trying to highlight red and you're adding white, it's going to get more desaturated. So the trick there is add some yellow as well as white and the same thing with green. So if I add, white to this green, it's going to get pretty desaturated. In this case, I'm okay with that. But if I'm trying to paint green grass or something and I have a green like this, we'll do a quick test. Um, I don't want it to do that. Well, I have very limited range of colors here. Let's see. I do have clear yellow. So not using white and black to make highlights and shadows is the first answer. So if you're, if you've got a middle color blue, and you're trying to make shadows for it, start by mixing in a darker color blue uh, and then mix in black or something even darker. 
Uh, yes, if you mix brown, brown is a way to desaturate something. So if you're trying to make a green darker, you want a darker green or a blue. So you want to use a saturated color. So a brown is already a desaturated color. A brown is, where did my color wheel go? So a brown is a desaturated version of either red, orange, or yellow as a rule. Well, here, if I turn around this way, you can see all of those colors at once. So if you, so what these are, and we talked about this last week too. So if after this show, you want to go watch the video on demand from last week, which I think was November 8th, um, I'll, it explains this in more depth. But if you look very closely at one of these color wheels, you will see them talk about a shade, tone, and a tint. So a tint is what happens if I add white to the color. A tone is what happens if I add gray to a color. And a shade is what happens if I add black to a color. In every single case, it desaturates it. Generally, when you add anything to a color, you're going to desaturate it a little. Um, I mean, unless it's a desaturated color, you're adding a saturated color. But what, you, what you're aiming for is desaturating it less. So black, white, and gray automatically kill colors a little. Um, adding the complement also dulls the color down. It often does it in a more attractive way. So you could try, if you had your bright green and you're trying to make a darker version, try adding a little bit of red to it and see if that makes a more attractive color. Um, but what I really say is add a darker green and then to make your very darkest shadows, add something you know, like black or I like blue liner a lot, especially with colors like green because it's got that little bit of blue in it. So it helps keep it from getting totally dark. Um, you can try adding purple even. Uh, use, use more pure colors, more saturated colors to do your thing. So this, oh, let's use this green because this is, it's dark, but it is a fairly saturated green. And I'll do a couple of different ones. And then that's, see, I don't have a light green handy, I don't think. At least not, I only have transparent colors at my desk. So I just have the color, wait, you know what? Maybe I do have a light green. Yeah, I have jade green. So I'll try that one too. This is already, so this is a green that has some white in it. So if you look at, and the reason I'm not using this color is because it's that transparent out of the bottle. So this is a color like this that somebody added white to. Um, so it's already desaturated. And that may be some of the problem you're having if you're starting off with colors that aren't very pure in the first place. So I'm gonna add just yellow to this one, yellow and white to that one, and just white to this one. I'll add a little more of the green to this because I added bits of highlight. So that starts making it go pastel because it's just white. And pastel is a version of desaturation. This is a much more vivid green because I added yellow instead. Sorry, I forget I have to tip the... But the yellow wasn't as powerful, so it's not as lighter in color. So I'm going to add another drop of yellow. White and black also tend to be more powerful than um, more saturated colors. So you often have to add less to make your shadows and highlights. So you can see how different those are, starting with the same color. Um, and now let's try it with both, because maybe you don't want your green to turn to yellow. And there my solution is I, I would add a bit of yellow and a bit of green. So this made it lighter, but you can see that it's still got a little more color to it than the one where it was just white. And I took away all the original colors so you can't compare. So let's put that back. And I'm gonna thin it out. Uh, this works better on white paper because if you do this on white paper, it's essentially like making the color lighter. Um, but it helps you see the, that it is a pretty saturated green. So let's try it with this, which 
is already somewhat desaturated, but a lot of your miniature paints are going to already have stuff in them. Very few miniature paints are just pure color. That's why some people talk about using art store paints or single pigment paints or whatever. So now I want to make this darker. So this is a pretty dark green that we just had here. So I think that would work well. Um, do I have a true blue? I do not have a true dark blue, but we'll try this um, blue liner that I mentioned. And let's see if I have a dark brown. I have a really dark brown. I'll try this purple though, out of curiosity. So I have purple. Trying to see if I have any kind of dark brown here. Let me see my spares that I brought out for a different purpose. Nope, none of those are dark brown. So I can, I'll try this with a middle brown. Um, it's not going to probably be as dark as what you were trying to use, but we'll give it a shot. Wow, this really wants to be stuck. And it hasn't been that long since I've used Nightshade Purple. Seriously. All right, we're going to, since the, the Crow's Nest Pokey Tool is a little longer. Nope. All right, now I'm going to risk my shirt because this is when I have problems. So there, the paint is caked up in the uh, thing, and it's possible that the little agitator is up in there. And this is, it's too bad it's such a dark paint to see, but you can see it's kind of level with the lip there. This will happen sometimes and you won't realize and the paint will thicken up in there even while the rest of your paint is fine. So every now and then you have to do maintenance on your paints and check for that and whether you need to add water and stuff. Which is a process I just recently completed and I thought I had done on this paint. I am gonna add a little bit of water. And then you need to shake it well, so I'm going to briefly turn off the sound so you don't hear my um, mechanical agitator. I'll do it the old-fashioned way first. And I think that makes the camera shake. I apologize for that. All right, there we go. Finally got some out of that. Although I think that was maybe... No, it's, I don't think it's that much more than the others. But these colors are... Um, all of these shade colors may be more powerful than the green, and I would have to add more green. But let's try the darkest brown I have is black and brown. And this is actually how, if I, uh, if in the first Learn to Paint kit, I didn't, you know, I only had 11 colors. So I put in a saturated green so that you could paint grass and other stuff. But I also wanted you to paint an orc. And that's exactly how I made a desaturated orc skin color. I have you mix the green and the brown together. All right, so let's see what happens. We'll do the one with the brown first. And especially a brown that's kind of a reddish brown, that is really gonna start killing the green because red is the complement of green. And that's, uh, if you mix two color complements together, that's how you desaturate it. That one's even almost grayed out because there's some white in there. <laughs> Price said that's a very, very clever pokey tool. Yes, I always have to do that just in case uh, Michael is watching, he would be so sad if I didn't use the Crow's Nest Pokey Tool. I actually have one Pokey Tool that I think I wore out and the pin is drying. So. so this was with the purple, which it turns into like a, a weird gray color a little bit. Well, not gray exactly, but it's still got a little more going on. Now that was a, it, that was a desaturated purple. If I did this with a vivid purple, it would work even better. Um, but I don't think I... I think I need to just start keeping a um, stock of standard paints near this desk for when people ask me questions I didn't prepare for. So I'm not sure that got dark enough, so I'm just going to make it a little darker. And you can see it's more of a dark green. It's not as rich as that, but it, it's definitely richer than these two. And then finally... I'll use the darker green and it should be richer again and definitely I'm going to need some dark, more darker green. Oh, I, 
think I need some more again. So this goes back to something else we talked about last week and that I've mentioned before that is kind of a thing that miniature painters don't think about. A lot of people seem to come from scientific backgrounds or other things where we're used to formula and stuff like that. Uh, pigment doesn't work that way. So some pigments are just stronger than others. Yellow is a very weak pigment. If I wanted to mix a blue and a yellow together to make green, I'm gonna have to use like four or five drops of yellow to one drop of blue. So it has what we call weak tinting strength. So in all of those cases, you can see that it's darker, but it's it's definitely more vivid than using the brown. Um, and whether, you know, maybe you don't want it to shift blue and you'd rather just use a dark green. That's when you make those decisions. But let's see, War Shadow said, I did a limited paint challenge with four colors, but had to use a fifth color with the green and the brown. So with a limited paint scheme, that's gonna happen. There are gonna be colors you cannot make. Um, there's a couple of schemes where you can kind of cheat it a little. So if you use, you have four colors and you use a red, blue, and a yellow, you're gonna get closer than, than with other things. Um, you're still not gonna be able to make everything because even if you had like a true saturated red and a true saturated yellow and a true saturated blue, there are gonna be colors you can't make. Um, and I will give you an example of that. So this is a very saturated red, this is very saturated yellow, this is very saturated green. These are in fact the closest to pure colors. These, I mean, they're, they pretty much are pure colors that Reaper sells. The reason they call them clear is because they're transparent. And that's one of those things that's the nature of pigments. So if you had these three colors in black, I would actually go these three colors in white for the, op the optimal number of mixing things. You would be able to mix a ton of colors. There would still be colors you can't make. This is one of them. I can turn magenta into red, but there's no way to turn red into magenta. Um, we didn't talk too much, we, we talked about it a little bit, is using a split primary palette if you wanna have a limited color scheme, or a limited color palette that's like you have only 12 paints that you take with you traveling or whatever. Um, I will probably do that in another show. I bet Anne talks about this all the time. She talks about these clears all the time too. but. When, when you do a limited color scheme, there are absolutely things you're not gonna be able to make. But everything you make is gonna go together. If you have only four colors, you're mixing colors together to make other colors, all of those colors are gonna go together. They may not be pretty colors that you like, but the end result should work as a cohesive color scheme on the figure. So that is the upside of um, limited paint challenges. The other upside is that working with constraints not having all of the tools you're used to, not having perfect colors, it pushes you, it helps you learn things, it helps you see things. Um, you know, I don't know what your four colors were, but if you had um, like that magenta and this green, make a, a dark color that you could use for shadows. Um, I will show you even because I like it, although I will probably, now I'm spoiler alerting another day because I had a plan for another mini that I paint sometime. Hold on, I didn't shake this one in advance. And because of that whole tinting straight thing, I'm not going to apply these together right away. So I'm going to start with the magenta because I know that's going to be the less strong color. And I'll just bring in some of this green. And it's going to, like, it's not black, but it's pretty close to black. That's why I was saying I would probably skip black and take white. If I could have three colors, I'm gonna to wanna to have white. Um, in fact, it looks black on the screen, but let's thin it out some and you'll see that it's not black, but it would work. So let's mix that with this green now and see what happens. And it, it's a little desaturated because now I'm mixing a bunch of colors together, but it's also a pretty nice color. It's a nicer color than that. So brown liner, troll hide, orc skin, and drown nipple purple. I'm not remembering troll hide offhand. I do know all those other colors. You are starting with colors that are all super desaturated. Um, 
there's no way to mix those colors and not make things more desaturated. You're probably ending up with something. It's not a monochromatic scheme, but it's a very desaturated color scheme, which you can do cool things with. So what you would have to do is push value. The most important thing would be to use different values over your figure to distinguish things and then also push uh, textures is another way to... Um... So drown up purple was your lightest? No. Which one was your lightest color? You need a light color too. Um, but yeah, so you were starting out with all desaturated colors. So they're only going to get more and more desaturated. So the other thing we talked about last week, you know, with the tint and the tone thing, all of the colors you picked already have white, gray, or black in them. Um, so then what color is orc skin? Wings, I can maybe I'm... Is orc skin like a, a tan, yellowy brown? Or is that another green? Um, but yeah, that's the, where you ended up with problems. You didn't have a light color, and those are all desaturated colors, which is, you can work with that. You can do some interesting things with that. But you can't go in expecting to get um, saturated colors out of it. So all of your colors started like this with um, black, white, or gray in them. And probably, so gray is like you have black and white. So that's dulling things even more. Um, so the when, you, when you're mixing and you want to get pure colors or more saturated color options. So when I did a four color challenge recently, not recently, a while ago. Hold on just a minute, I'll get the miniature. Where'd you go? Very small. So I'm gonna have to zoom way in. So I, I did this guy with four colors. And literal four colors, no white, which is where I went wrong. So what I used was Osiris and Sand, Polished leather, so really this is my yellow, or no, I used yellow mold. Used yellow mold, so I had two yellows instead of having a white. Uh, violet red because it's, um, so I knew I would, this isn't what's going to be as saturated as this, but a true magenta is going to be transparent and I didn't want to deal with that nonsense. So I accepted that, you know, I could never make a true red with this. So when I mixed a red, which is what his hat is, it was never going to be, you know, a bright, vivid red. Um, and then the last one was that green that I was showing you, the oven green. So if you look at those thinned out, which is what this part is on the, on the labels, it's kind of like, it's, it's called the undertone. It's to show you kind of the colors underneath that. If you did that with, um, the colors you picked, they're all going to be really faded looking. Which again, you can do, like if you think of a figure in Twilight, those would be great colors to use because in Twilight, I, can't, I can never remember if it's rods or cones that we see colors with, um, but in, in darker light, one of those doesn't work very well. So mostly what you're just seeing is light versus dark. Hey Raiders, hi Michael Mortar and friends. Thank you for joining us. We're talking about color schemes and mixing colors. And um, someone had a question in the chat about, you know, they were mixing green with brown and it got really desaturated and they were wondering why. So I was just doing some examples of other things you could mix greens with and have that not happen. But then it turned out that they were using a limited color scheme. And when you have a limited color scheme, that's, that's one of the limitations is it does affect what you can uh, mix. But the reason I chose some of the colors I did for my limited color scheme, the elven green, and then where did that, is because I, I knew about this trick. I knew that if you mix a green and a magenta, you get a kind of a black. So it was okay if I didn't have a really dark color in my color scheme, because I had a way to mix a dark color. Um, now it's not, it doesn't go as dark as black. Uh, but it's at least fairly dark. Now, what I missed out on is I picked this instead of a white, and I think I would have done better to have the pure white to be able to push the highlights up to the top. So I do plan on redoing this figure with a slight twist to that color scheme. That was something I was going to do on another show. 
but not today. Kurt said, I'm still trying to make hot turquoise and I get the right color, but it's not the right vibrancy. Um, is that a Reaper color? Is that one of the pro paints? Is that why I'm not remembering it? Because it sounds familiar, but I just went through all my paints and I don't remember that one. So, um, I, I hope that answered your question a little bit that, I mean, I know it's probably not the answer you wanted to have, War Shadow, um, but it at least you, hopefully helps you understand why that happened. And, and that would be my answer to that is if those were the colors I had to work with, I would try to think of it as, okay, I'm painting someone who's like in a twilight environment or, uh, you know, they're just, it's, it's like, uh, who's that guy? that does the DC movies and he takes all the color out of everything. Think of it like that. You want to make a color, a character that looks like that instead of trying to make a color that has viv a character that has vivid colors on them like this. If you're starting with desaturated colors, that, that would never be possible. But for the benefit of the people who just showed up, I'm talking about where we can get ideas from color schemes and while fantasy novel covers and, and other people's uh, paint jobs are a great answer, People who do package design and stuff like, you know, room arrangement and things like that, they are well trained in how colors go together and the psychology of colors. Hi, the ball GM. Buy the ball GM. Um, so why don't we steal from them? Because they know what they're doing. Web design manuals, too, that will have uh, stuff like that. Um, Kirsten, I, it may be that one of the pigments they used is not something available in what you're trying to mix with. So there are different pigments. Occasionally pigments do become unavailable. I think most of the miniature companies use a pretty similar group of pigments. Because it's stuff that's, um, you know, light, fast, reliable, vibrant, and cheap. Uh, which means there, there is no, there is no blue that looks like this in the Reaper line. I went through every single blue. It's not there. And that is because all of the blues are mixed with um, Thalo and you can't get there from here. Um, and that's probably because this is ultramarine blue, which isn't a super expensive pigment, but it's definitely more expensive than Thalo. Um, what, what I might do, Kirst, is uh, if you know someone who's really good with color or you know like a traditional artist or if you come to ReaperCon, you could try asking Anne um, to see if they could mix it for you. It, it's, you often have to give something up with a mixed color. So if, if getting the mid-tone is the most important thing because you're trying to match an army or something, just go with that and accept that the shadows and highlights are going to look a little different. Those guys' uniforms are older or a different dye batch or whatever. Um, Sometimes you have to shift your perspective instead of your expectations. But, uh, so this is actually uh, an artist color. This is Liquitex acrylic gouache, which is a weird way of saying Liquitex reinvented miniature paint, but there you go. Um, so now I can have ultramarine blue because even Chimera, who, who does pure pigment paints for miniature painters, they don't have ultramarine blue yet. And this, I love this blue. I do not love Thalo blue. I tend not to like blues derived from Thalo. There are some um, less saturated blues and stuff that I like, all right. But this, this is the blue that makes my heart sing and this is not, so to have access to this, which granted I haven't really used on miniatures yet because I try to use stuff that you guys can get access to, but I'm sure that I will. So anyway, to go back to what we were originally talking about is me trying to copy this color scheme. And I had picked out a series of paints that I have now terribly disarranged, so we'll see if I can figure out what I was doing. Um, and then we were discovering that my eyeballing, even though I have my little swatch things, maybe wasn't 100% correct. So for the benefit of the people who came in later, I'll just put my slideshow up very briefly. Oh, Quindy, it's next month, because they teased Ultramarine. So Quindy says that Chimera is coming out with a set that has Ultramarine in it next month. They teased it like months ago, and I, I was like, if you can give me PB29, Bring it. That's what I want out of life. All right. So here I took a, a picture with my cell phone of this, and then I went to, um, so I have procreate on my iPad. There are other programs too. I was trying to figure out free ways to tell you to do this. The best free way that I know of, or the one that I can feel confident recommending is something called GIMP. 
you can get it for um, Mac or PC. It is as complicated as Photoshop though, but all you need to do this is to find the little thing that looks like an eyedropper and then you use, you click that and you put it over the section of the, the picture that you want to sample the color from. You click and then you get the paintbrush thing and you go over to the side and you do a little swatch, a little circle or something like what I did here with the paintbrush. So you don't have to learn all of the stuff of Photoshop. It's just, I, I was trying to figure out, like probably the, the program that comes with, is it paint that comes with PCs? I switched from a PC to a Mac like three years ago, so I no longer remember anything. Um, uh, but there, there are easy ways to do this and I'm sure that there are ways to do it on your phone. I just, I also have an iPhone and I have Procreate on that. So I have, I'm not that familiar with all of these um, different options, but there are options or free options to do this. And this is, if you have trouble eyeballing this and saying, well, I don't do this one. Well, the other thing you can do is, is try stuff. So you, ha you will have to paint out physical samples of your paint. Like this will kind of work. Hold on. I, do, I gotta switch back now. So doing this kind of works, but it's better if you have that. So this is the color I thought matched better. But what if I wasn't sure? I could just get some various options. So I could just get some different skin colors and go, okay, is it that one? Is it that one? Oh, that's way pinker. Nope, that's not it. Is it this one? No, that's way browner. That's not it. The skin color is maybe not the best one to, to try it on. So let's try it on this orangey, rusty red. And I said rusty red and I put that there, but that's a little too red rusty red. Whereas this um, Numeria rust that I picked, that matches better. So it sometimes helps to get like a bunch of a thing and do it. You know, clearly that's not it. That is way too yellow. So if you have trouble visualizing color, like give yourself more options to compare with instead of just expecting to, you know, look at this and then go over to your shelf and you're not even comparing. Uh, Quindy says the Chimera set is awesome. Every single color is gorgeous. They showed it off on the Monte San Savino live stream on Saturday with live swatches. Uh, where, where might we watch that Quindy? If we too wanted to see the awesome colors. Uh, I am Terjan. I have a game color ultramarine blue from Vallejo. Reaper makes an art ultramarine blue. It is not ultramarine blue. Um, I didn't bring it with me to demonstrate that, but so the thing about colors and pigments is they're two different things. So when I said ultramarine blue, what I really meant was PB29, which is pigment blue 29. That is the color that makes my heart sing. I could make this paint and call it ultramarine blue if I wanted to. There is no law against this. There's no other reason that would stop me other than why would I torture consumers by calling this ultramarine blue, but I could. So what there is a law about is if you do label the pigments on, on your paints, you have to say what's really in, you, know, you have to use the real pigments. Um, I don't know if you have to use all of them, but I think you probably, there's stuff that's not pigment that you can mess with stuff. But if they're gonna go ahead and put these on here, this is what you use. It doesn't matter what the name is. Um, which is another reason people who like pure paints like pure paints, but when it comes to miniatures, I don't care. Uh, Carrie Michael Cosby loves Procreate and I too love Procreate. Um, Procreate is awesome. So I was, when you, after you do your dropper thing, you will have it on a screen. A screen is not useful to compare, you know, I'm doing it again. If we pretend this is my phone screen and I'm comparing this, it's not gonna help me because the way screens make colors. Pendrake says some states have false advertising laws. Um, the color names are not, like they don't fall under that. Uh, most art companies, you see, even fine art companies, you'll find some that will say this is cadmium orange hue. Hue at least tells you that it's not really cadmium orange. So they will try to do stuff like that. In that case, they're doing it because they know people are afraid of cadmium orange. So they want to say you get the cool color of cadmium orange without the dangerous properties of cadmium orange. But because we just use color names in everyday life, it's, it doesn't fall under advertising. 
if you told me that that was pure ultramarine blue and you put PB29 on it and then you didn't use PB29 to make it, that would be false advertising. Anyway, so print out your swatches instead of trying to match against a screen. I, I have a whole rant about buying paints based on online swatches, but that is definitely for another day. So now I'm gonna test the colors I picked. So this was kind of a little lighter and that was like a little darker. That's more the shadow color. So I'll put both of these out. This was the uh, picture that I took with my phone. This was the one I used with my scanner. Apparently my eyes um, shift colors the same way my phone does and not the way my scanner does. Because I think I'm reasonably close here. I'm in the ballpark of these colors. And again, the ultimate test for the, for the people who um, came in late, the ultimate test was whether I came up with a group of colors that works together. So I will also paint some of those colors. First, I'm gonna... So people who've been here before know that I will make these sheets and then I'll put them somewhere and then I'll put something else on top of them. So before I do that, I'll put that over there. And then I'll just do little samples of every color that I chose on here. And we'll see at the end if we have something that looks like a color scheme that we can use on Mr. Elf. Also known as, see I've forgotten his name already. Atlanter, the Lost Prince. We don't know what he's lost from, but he is a pretty cool figure. And I thought he suited an autumnal color scheme that wasn't like stereotypical. So I'll just do a little bit of a, the swatches here to compare at the end. And then I do have an even lighter highlight color, but partly because of some of the desaturation things that we were talking about, a lot of my highlight colors are going to be different than theirs. And that in fact is even lighter than theirs, but I'm going to, you know, th these are nice pillows, but I need to have <laughs> Chris said, look at that face. He's too proud to ask for directions. That seems very accurate. Um, I'm going to need a greater range of, of shadow highlight contrast than the people who took the pillow picture. All right, so I don't know if you agree. It's not identical, but I think that's close enough to the ballpark of the top one, and I like the pinker element more than I like the brown one, so I think I am going to just live with the top colors. Oh, well, hold on. How did I mess this up? Oh, this was the top of the pillow. That's right. So this pillow, I felt the top and the bottom were different colors, but I really like the bottom better for skin. So I am not even going to bother matching to the top because this doesn't match the top, but I am okay with that. All right, so let's go to the orange pillow, which is that one, which really I think was the easiest one to match visually. Kirst said Atlanter's face looks like he's too proud to ask for directions. That is probably true. Keep a little bit of this. And put it on my neutral paper. And then what did I pick out for the shadow colors for that? I have a darker shadow for the skin color too. But for this one, if I want to go real dark, I'll go with black and brown. But just a little bit darker. I picked out chestnut brown. Which apparently is a dripping color. So it's not identical. I think it's pretty close. And the greens. So this is one where right before the show, I saw a different green and I wasn't sure if it might be better. So I had picked out Ancient Oak, although I knew that was not quite dark enough. But then right before the show, I remembered that I had this Elven Green set off to the corner. But I think it's a little too saturated, but we'll try both of them. Quindy has posted the link to 
the um, live stream demonstrating the Chimera colors. Quindy is so wonderful with links. You are right, Kirst. Because I'll just randomly remember something off my blog where honestly it can take me five minutes to find a thing that I know is there. Um, and she goes and gets it right away. Despite my best attempts at having a um, table of contents one up. So now that I've got it on the paper, yeah, this, this is a vivid green. And that's why I suggest the thinning it down. So, oops. Thinning it down with maybe slightly less water than that. Because I don't think that elven green works. Now, let's just quickly find out what happens if we mix them together. Because maybe that makes the perfect one. And, nope, I think it's still too saturated. It doesn't have that fall vibe. So we fire Elven Green, despite the fact that Ellen Turr is an elf. He doesn't want Elven Green. So this color, I chose a metallic for. But if I were doing non-metallic, that would not be a problem. Because we have kind of versions of that. And here's where I would, you know, do my comparison again. And I did this thing with the metallic, so I'm holding the metallics up to it. And none of the silvers, like, they just weren't... They just weren't right. They were too blue or too gray or something. So drow skin seems like it might be kind of that color, but eh, I didn't quite love it. I didn't love it as much as synth flesh. I felt was closer. But in this case, I pick oh burnished platinum is a bit too purple, I think. So I think pieces of eight if I want a true metallic, and then synth flesh synth flesh if I wanted to do non-metallic, which I choose not to at this time. So I'll put those back off to the side. I could probably make the drow skin work once you start adding the lighter, you know, adding white or cream in to make highlights. But... Right. And I had the jade green in so you can see there's just a little too much yellow in that. All right. So... I, this will be a harder test because once I put out the metallic, and here I'm going to use my shaker again. Metallics fall out of suspension so fast. Because yes, for the benefit of people who have not watched this show before, if you haven't already been bored and scared off, um, I shake all my paints before the show, so I only shake them a little bit when you see me use them on screen. So I definitely recommend shaking paints more than you see me. So yeah, it's actually still, it's a little bit more purple than what's here. This kind of has a bit of a green vibe. But then the question will be whether it works together. I did forget my orange highlight, which is pumpkin orange. Although this is a limited edition color, I figure most of you might have it now because of all the specials that recently happened. And it is a little bit more saturated, but I would be eventually mixing cream or something in there. So I'm okay with that. Put it over here. Put a little bit of my shadow color here. Maybe that is a little too orange. I don't know. I might have to dull it down before I add it as a highlight. And that's why I'm doing this test. And this is taking me longer than it would take me to do if I was just doing this for myself because I'm talking you guys through it and I'm testing different things and stuff. If you want to try this yourself, it is not going to be this horrible. I promise. Um, I did not put the green on. But it's... Uh, so what did I hear another artist saying recently? Failing to plan is planning to fail. So this stuff that you do ahead of time when you do color tests or, um, you know, maybe when I've been testing those dry brushes, those shows, when I've been testing using different wash colors, those th are things that to me a few years ago would have felt like a waste of time. 
but now I tend to think of them as, as learning tools, as ways of making less mistakes on the miniatures when I'm painting them. So if I can make fewer mistakes on the miniatures and not have to do repainting and eventually get quicker. So here I am using an out of print color because I love Miss Green. I don't know why it went away and I feel like it's the perfect highlight for this. But I do have another color that I picked out too, which is another Pathfinder color, Bogart Green. But I'm concerned that if I mix that directly into the um, ancient oak, it'll it will desaturate. It'll start to white out because there's a lot of white and bogger green very clearly. And maybe it's a different kind. It's too jade. Those work together. I don't know if that one works. I would probably rather just add in like a, a yellowy color like Osiris Sand or Yellow Mold to that to get lighter highlights. Rings Raccoon says, it takes me forever to find the colors I want to use. I have 500 bottles to go through. So I don't know if you guys remember last week where I was trying to estimate how many paints I had and I said my husband knew and then he went and did the math again and we're pretty sure it's between eight and 900. So most of them are up on a wall like this. All, all the Reapers are up on a wall like this, other than the ones I keep at my desk that are the pure colors that I grabbed to do some of the demonstrations. Um, some of the other colors aren't up on the wall yet. I think that's because there may not be room on the wall and I have to address that problem. So where was my metallic? And I did pick out a shade for my metallic and I would do uh, Michael Proctor style and do shaded metallics. I did not pick out a highlight for my metallic, which I need to do, but that, since I like to paint things that are on the edges of the miniature um, near the end of the process, I'm not overly concerned about having my metallic highlight to hand right now. I am, I do think that pieces of eight might not be fully mixed. That looks watery to me. Whereas it does not look watery there. So I think the color looks too purple because even though I just did this, this is metallics are the worst for this. So when I'm really worried about there being sludge at the bottom, I use an old paint handle. Yes, so it's clumped. Even though I did this one, I mean, I didn't do it, you know, in the past month or two, but I did it when we were swatching um, the Reaper Con color, like when I first did my shows about swatching. So it's been within six months that I um, did maintenance on this paint, and it already has fallen enough out of suspension that this is a problem. So since this is binder, like I don't always worry about this, but since it's binder, I'm gonna put it back in. So that is why my color looked off on the um, other swatch. We'll see what it looks like now that the metallic flake is more mixed in. Again, I will be silencing for mixing. So yeah, I think I have all of the Reaper paints except two. I think there were two uh, nine six, you know, nine six paints that they do for cons or whatever that were like Pathfinder on or something else that I didn't go to. So I am a legit Reaper fan girl, in case you were wondering. So what I chose to use as a shadow for this is a purple, but it's a pretty desaturated purple. But I felt like a straight gray. So yeah, that you can see the difference in the color once I mix the flake back in. Um, so let's put it on here. Wow, I'm glad I changed my shirt before the show because I, I'm really bad about this. I have pink clothes because this kind of thing will happen. So it still does not match this. It's still a little purplier or whatever than this. It's closer to that one. But I, then I have to go back to, do I care because does my stuff go together? So I didn't bother with this one. This is where I went wrong on both versions. 
because I think this looks yellow. But all of my little dropper things are greeny yellows or yellowy greens, maybe. So I have to make a decision about whether, whether I want to follow this or whether I want to follow my imagination. So I will test. This was the, I mean, this is a very light color and I do want this to be, you know, if he was a platinum blonde or whatever, I want this to be prominent on his skin. I mean, his hair. But there's got to be some shadow colors. I mean, one of the things that makes hair look like hair is a fair amount of contrast. So I picked out some uh, darker colors. And this isn't the darkest one. And then as I got down into the shadows, I did start feeling like I saw a little more green. So I picked out Uniform Brown, which is a brown that has a little bit of green in it, maybe. I don't know. But really, there, there's... There are several weeper colors that are this kind of, you know, faded khaki. So I could go get those. I don't feel like they sound like hair color though. So I have to test how much I care in the end. Because this really does not match. This does not match the design of the people here. This probably looks yellow in the picture because of these colors being around it. Um, but. I'll do my other test of do I care. So if I put these yellow colors down here next to these, do I feel like it still is a pleasant thing to look at? Like does it work harmoniously? And maybe the answer is that I don't. I don't know. I think these work, that they're neutral enough that they work. I don't think this works at all. I think that I will have to find a different shadow color for the hair. And I actually, I thought I would picked things that worked pretty well. I did have one more color I picked out, which is called Faded Khaki. But I don't think I like that one either. I mean, I don't know. Do you feel like that one goes with these? You know, it does have a fall vibe. I don't know if I feel like it goes with those greens. But I think I could make it work. But I don't think this works. I think I'll just have to find some other thing to mix with this to make a shadow. Or get up from here and go look for things. But Like the colors they had, I actually pulled some out. So this Medusa green matches theirs pretty well. And what else did I have? Bone shadow seemed like it might fit the shadow colors. So once I did the printout, I could see the color better. And I think these matches are not bad. So this one and this one. Even though they don't look like they go together. But those are colors that I pulled out of the thing. But now the question is, if I try some of those shadow colors, what would I get? Oh, there's my color. So, hmm. if I mix the amber gold with the faded khaki, no, not with the faded khaki, with this um, bone shadow, which I have used on blonde hair before, for a shadow, I really like russet brown, like if I'm just doing a general thing. Does that feel like it goes? And that's like a nice neutral. So I think that might be my answer. His hair is not going to be very vibrant. 
I mean, I can cheat and do some stuff at the end if I think it needs yellow for some reason. But I think maybe that just, we consider that a neutral area because I don't see how to, like, making green here. So I guess he's an elf. I don't know. My other concern with the greens is, like, having two greens together seems... Like maybe not ideal. You know, as these are drying, I'm not in love with either of those greens, I don't think. Let's put that very precious out of print color on this piece of paper. Let's see. And I think it might be too vibrant. So I think that I'm in fact firing both Miss Green and Bogart Green. So here you go. I thought I had it all figured out and I would just be doing this for show for you guys. And I have learned some things. Like these are too vibrant for this, you know. If I take this away, things start being more harmonious again, I think. Even with uh, those colors that I, you know, the yellow colors that I mistakenly picked for the hair. So I think I probably can go back to these if I shift my green, if I make my greens duller. So the saturated co or desaturated colors are not always bad. There are times, in fact, when you want desaturated colors. So if I use something like this Medusa green as the highlight, is that going to be more harmonious with these things. And I think that yes, it is. Are you guys like all bored to tears? This is probably the most boring thing I've ever done. But I, I, sometimes when we make videos and we're trying to make fast peppy videos to show you how we do things or I write articles or whatever, I feel like we're glossing over the stuff that people who kind of know a little more about what they're doing do that you guys maybe don't see. Like you think we just know color. Like you must be painting after a certain point or you're born with artistic talent and you just know color. And there may be people like that. Anne has a very good eye for color. She maybe started with an advantage. I did not. I was actually terrible at this in the beginning. I've gotten here by working, by being willing to do these tests, by studying color theory over and over again. Um, by being willing, I had one, the little Cthulhu um, GB guy. So last last month we were looking at some of the special edition um, GB characters, and the Lou, I think I think they called him Lou, is uh, one of the ones that's available in Bones. I redid the shadow color on that guy four times, four different versions of desaturated purple before I found the one that looked right. Um, so I definitely am not just automatic at this stuff. Uh, and, and sometimes you have to do stuff instead of painting the figure over and over again. This is probably a better way to do it than painting the figure over and over again. I think I am still going to fire that and keep this for hair. I think platinum, platinum blonde hair is very dull in color. So I think I have my final selection of colors. And I just have to remember what goes with what now. I had them all kind of organized by which pillow it was, went with. Um, that goes with that pillow. I've lost a lid down under my desk and I'll, I'll make you, I won't make you guys watch me try to flail under my desk. I will get that later. So I think I have my little tray of colors. And for those who weren't here before, I do recommend uh, project boxes. I've only recently started doing it. It's amazing how many things I've been painting forever. I only did this since I started doing this show because I was showing you guys swatches and then somebody said something about put it on the label and I put it on the label and I'm like, well, that's a lot. But like this is this is wet palette, sable brush level game changer for me, I think. Like I am so happy I did this. Now I have the amazing project of all of those paints I told you about, all 800 of those paints or whatever that are on the wall. They need to be rearranged to because now I can see the values more accurately. They need to be rearranged by value. So I have my little paper as a guide if I need it. Now we can start painting Mr. Elf. A lantern. See, now he's not lost. He has a map. He has a color map. 
So um, the next post I'm going to put on my blog is not talking about color maps. I did one not long ago uh, about a digital way to do this kind of testing. Um, you still have to match the paints, but it's a digital way to figure out what do you want where on your figure. Uh, do these colors basically work together? But uh, the next one coming up is going to be about value mapping, figuring out which parts I want to be darker and lighter and how dark and light do I want the highlights and shadows to be. So that will be coming out soon when I finish editing it. Now I just have to get out my wet palette. And my water is surprisingly dirty considering I haven't painted anything on miniature yet. Where am I time wise? So we're not going to get too far. We'll probably... Would you guys enjoy seeing me continue to paint him and, and see if it all works in practice in the end? Because um, it would probably take me a couple of shows to get him painted. I am thinking of some stuff to do over the next few months, but uh, so I'm going to be on Crow's Nest tomorrow. So I'm not going to, I'm going to tease, I'm going to pull her on. I'm not going to give you any hints about what I'm doing the next few months, other than we know what time of year it is. Uh, but I will give hints tomorrow. And then possibly I'll change my mind because I have been known to have like a whole plan for the show and then Saturday night go, oh wait, what if I did this instead? All right. So an inside out approach we get to painting him. I think the first thing that has to get painted is the inside of this cloak because everything else is on top of it and I'm probably not gonna have to do that much to it. So I liked the idea of, you know, the, the pink, the pink pillow is his skin. The yellow pillow is his hair, the yellowy green pillow. Uh, I was thinking of this for his, um, it's not a jerkin, robe, surcoat, I don't know. I need to learn all the words. This for the metallics and this for the cloak. So my thought with doing this for the cloak instead of the orangey one is his face is going to be, have some pink in it. If I put the green of that cloak next to it, that's those are complementary colors. Those draw attention. It will help make his face stand out. Then he's going to have that super pale hair coming over the darkest co main color used. And that will hopefully also help draw attention up here because I am very bad at getting my focus area you know, you, you kind of want to paint, unless you're telling a different story with the figure. There are sometimes there's specific stories you want to tell that would break this rule, but in in absence of any other uh, guiding principle, you kind of want to think like they're on a stage and the, the spotlight is centered right here, and then things kind of fade out as you get out here. So I did heat this up with a hair dryer right before the show. It's, it's improved, but it still looks a little bad, so I'm going to have to work on that while we're here. So, that is my plan, unless anyone thinks that's really horrible for some reason. You can mention that in the chat if you think I'm way off base. So, I'm going to go extra dark, because all of that's overhung. And, especially for those kinds of areas. So, in general, I've been practicing more with, you guys have seen it, I've been practicing more with painting up from the darkest color. Uh, I always have done that with cloaks like this because to try to get in all these little folds and do specific shadows is just a nightmare that I really don't want to engage in. Um, so it looks like there is some enthusiasm for me painting the whole guy. I know there's all kinds of, so there, it seems like, you know, there'll be like 40 or 50 or whatever people, I actually have no idea. I don't know how to look at the numbers while I'm doing it. Um, maybe Quindy can tell us now and then. But I know there's more people listening than chat. And I think that's just how, like, I'm often a lurker when I watch stuff, live things even. You know, if I have a pertinent question, I will ask it. If I don't, I'll just sit there and do my own thing. This is why this is a mixing brush now, because clearly it's not very good at being a brush. It may not even deserve to be a mixing brush. Because, yeah, that's a pain in the butt. Let's switch to this one. But um, for, for people who are lurking, if you have questions and you don't feel comfortable typing them in the chat, if you want to uh, private message me here or on Facebook or on my blog or wherever, if there's stuff you'd like to see me do or you just have a question like um, War Shadow did, of I tried doing X thing and Y thing happened and why did that happen and I hate it, um, 
you know, go for it. Ask me questions. Ask me anonymously. Even I don't know if there's a way to ask me anonymously. I would say ask me on the, the Reaper Discord, but honestly, I'm like super bad still at Discord. I'm trying to get better. I have a Patreon. I'm sure that people on my Patreon would enjoy um, if I had a Discord and stuff, but I'm like super old, so I'm having trouble adapting. Zeistist of Games says, lurking and listening while reading documentation for work. And Nomad Zeke is also at work. Quinny says, 37 right now and very normal for most to be lurkers. Thank you for the... Uh, the numbers, Quindy. So this is one of those times when sometimes it's challenging to have figures on an interval base because how do I get into this crevice between his feet and the, the cloak? And in fact, while I'm here, so this is just straight blue liner, which I consider darker than black because blue is a cool color and it kind of recedes from your eyes. I use this as a shadow color on black. So I'm putting it all under this crevice thing. Um, and I'll, I mean, I don't necessarily need to do it now, but I will put it there too. And that it's not a bad idea to look for spots like that, like spots you probably can't reach. Especially if you like priming in um, white or gray, which I typically prime in gray. Kind of the compromise prime. Um, and then I, I don't prime bones. I really don't. I don't uh, engage in a lot of, like I see conversations about that on the Reaper forums and stuff. And I, and sometimes I look and I'm like, I, nope, I said everything that I have to say in that fact on the forums and that Reaper sent out, like I just can't can't keep having this argument because I used to try to argue with people and say like, okay, even if you have a fine time priming, don't tell everyone else that it's going to be okay because I think it's, it's, um, climate. I think it all depends on your climate, uh, and that people in drier climates are probably the ones who can spray prime bones successfully. Or if you prime on a drier day. But I live in the land of humidity. I can't even spray prime metal miniatures most of the year. Uh, so I definitely brush prime a lot of things. All right. So interestingly, I learned recently that... Um, so I, I'm normally someone who... Uh, Ming says humidity is a thing. The struggle is very real. It is. But then on the other hand, we have a lot less trouble with um, wet blending and using wet palettes and stuff. So the humidity giveth and the humidity taketh away. Also, I guess we have less dry skin. But anyway, so I was saying that I have always kind of been very casual about hair drying paint. In fact, my hair dryer is right here on the very rare occasion that I use it on my head, I come over here. Um, but, so, and Anne's always said not to do it. Or not always, but I think recently she started saying not to do it. And I talked to her about why, and she said, because it shifts the color. And since I almost always do it on base coats, I'm like, eh, I don't care. But recently I was watching a thing from Liquitex, no, Golden. Liquitex or Golden. Uh, where they were talking about their version of miniature paints. And they said it wasn't great to do. Yes, oh, just, I know, if I put the palette in the frame, it usually makes the focus go all wonky. Plus, these colors probably all look like black to you, so what difference is it? Uh, but this is blue liner. This is the ancient oak mixed with blue liner, and then this is straight, straight ancient oak. And in this case, the base coat, I'm going to just try to do, like, a little bit of wet blending um, cause I'm going to have to apply multiple coats anyway, so why not start establishing some of my shadows and highlights because of this hair drying story I'm telling you, we're waiting now a little bit more than we would have normally. So I'm watching this thing from Liquitex or Golden, it's probably Golden. And they said it is kind of bad to hair dry the paint because if you have an underlying layer 
and you know if you think if you have a certain thickness of it and the top dries first you are likely to get um, they called it crazing so it's different than a crack so a crack is like the material it's very unlikely for um, acrylic paints to crack because it's a very flexible material um, I think that probably is more pertinent, you know, if you're working with two paint thicknesses of paint. But to be on the safe side, I'm trying to um, air dry a little less than I used to. Or, be, or do it only on air instead of heat. So I rarely have problems, but um, I know for a while I didn't use pure black because I used to use it on base rims. And I did get what I thought was cracking, but was probably crazing because I was being impatient and wanting to do the second coat on my base rim and um, using the hairdryer. So I very much suspect that that is what was going on. So this is, I don't, I don't care too much that this is pretty rough, maybe rough, maybe on the second pass I'll try to make it a little nicer or maybe I'll just wait until later to make it look nicer. I'm trying to get a little more, or maybe a little less, I'm trying to be a little less, everything has to be perfect at every step along the way, because I think that is something definitely that held back my painting, my enjoyment of painting, and my speed at painting. Ring says, I still use my hairdryer, but as I mentioned before, mine has a no heat setting, so I blow cool air over it. Yeah, I think that's probably a lot safer, and, and I finally figured out uh, how mine does do that. Or if you are someone who um, perpetually has your airbrush set up in a convenient location, you can use the, you know, if it's a dual action airbrush, you can just blow which if you have the Reaper one, it is a dual action airbrush. Um, you can just blow air out of it instead of blowing paint and air. So not quite dry there. Ah, but I have forgotten that he has a shoulder piece thing. Kind of got like a Sherlock Holmes, which I recently learned is called an Inverness coat. We have that little capelet dealy. Just trying to figure out what is coat and what is something other than well, cloak, not coat. These folds are fairly fine, so I'm not really going to try. And what blend every individual fold? I'm trying to establish the big picture shadow highlight location, which is also something I've been bad at. I will have a tendency to jump into details sooner than I ought to be done. I mean, sometimes we have to because it's just tough to reach things, but. He's got a little sleeve there. I'm going to have to ponder what color that should be. Well, that's probably still his robe, right? Oh, sometimes these fantasy outfits get hard to figure out. Like the Pathfinder miniatures. I love Wayne Reynolds' art, but that's... I don't know how those people get dressed. If I'm going to sneak attack them at night when they're dressing, there's like no way that they're going to be able to jump out of bed and put their armor on. That is not happening. Oh, 
the hood is also green. I mean, I guess I can make it another color, but I am not going to. I'm not nearly as creative as some people in interpreting what is what on a figure. I probably should think more specifically about what is the direction of light. So this is one reason that I recommend doing stuff like those color tests because we are expecting ourselves to do like everything at once. We're trying to do the brushwork and all the craft parts that are very challenging for most of us because we are tiny things. Um, we're trying to, you know, pick our colors and make them work. We're trying to pick our direction of light and then to pick that by where we put the shadows and highlights. And, you know, we're probably trying to do 20 other things besides pick out details, make a texture, whatever you're trying to do. Trying to, expecting yourself to do all of that at the same time is a big ask. Like, real artists, most real professional artists that work in, like, um, concept design or whatever, they don't do that. They can't do everything at once. They do a preliminary sketch, and then they, you know, they do a bunch of preliminary sketches, and then they take the most promising one and and do a little more of that, and then they'll do, like, a value study of how do you want to do it in the environment, and then they'll do, you know, a color study of what colors you're going to use. And then they do the final thing. Like very few artists are trying to do all of the things at the same time. And then we feel bad about it when we can't do it. Like when we fail, we think we're bad. We're, we're bad artists. And I think really it's just in our hobby, we have this expectation that you can do everything at once and you can't. So I think finding ways to break stuff up, um, Color study as a separate step, do value study as a separate step, rough things in and then make the blends pretty once you know where you want, you know, your direction of light and highlight and shadow. I mean, the, the obvious direction of light would be from here, I think, because then it's going to hit his face and, you know, help give him that extra proud stance. So there's going to be need to be like a ton more highlights right here even if I don't want it to be a highly contrasting type of cloth. All right, maybe I should mix up another highlight step. And what did I claim I would do that with? Medusa green. I'm going to mix more of my one shadow color too, because I seem to have used all of that up. I will show my palette in just a minute. I promise I'm not trying to hide that from you guys. Maybe someday I'll figure out how to do a palette cam, but since I've barely figured out how to do a face cam, I don't know how much hope I'd hold out for that. So as we've discussed before, I like to do this um, pre-mix my colors instead of mixing um, on the brush the way some people do. Like Michael Proctor, if you come and watch Crow's Nest tomorrow, I'm sure he will also be painting something and you can get some cool tips on how he handles the paint. But I like to do this and then not think about it much anymore after that. And just think about where am I putting all of these colors. And if I'm trying to be really super smooth, I will have more of those than less. Oh, I didn't mix the shadow though. I don't know, maybe a palette cam would be better than a face cam, but I think... Uh, so I've got this like... I, don't know, I call it like an octopus arm or something. It's not... It only has three or four arms, but it has like a arm that holds the mic and then an arm that holds the cell phone that I'm using for the face cam and then one that could reference an iPad, but I have it turned around the wrong way and there's one with a ring light. And I don't think any of them I could turn them so they're, they're looking down. I think I'd have to use a different kind of tripod or something to um, have a belt cam if I could figure out where to put all of that and still paint, because that ends up being the tricky part. 
this is a much more compressed area for painting than I normally have. But that's okay. Like I said, constraints um, help you learn how to do things. I mean, it doesn't have to be like the timer's on. It can more just be you have like an expectation of finishing up tonight or something like that. My highlight got white way too wide, as I'm sure happens to us all. But since that is the fold closest to the light, I do want to emphasize it a little bit. Am I? Oh, the camera's frozen. All of the cameras are frozen. Can you guys hear me? Say something in chat if you can hear me. Nope, okay, there we bounce back. I don't know how long it was frozen for. Quindy, I don't think it was you, because it happened to me too. So it looks like a lot of people are having a squirrely connection, so that sounds like Twitch is having a problem, not us. So I was working on um, wet blending this fold. I was trying to get a, a higher highlight on there, and then I noticed that the, the screen was having problems. Uh, so even though that's still a little shiny, I, I don't think it's wet enough to continue doing that. I think I would start lifting up paint. So I'm going to move over to another one. want to not lighten this up too much. I do want it to be a fairly dark color. So that's what the challenge is being here. Just trying to be fast and loose, but keep that darker color going. And there are two reasons I'm doing a second coat. Um, one is because I really, you know, I didn't do a lot with the highlights on the first coat. But also, um, you know, most paints, even if it's a fairly opaque paint, they're not going to be opaque enough to get full coverage in one shot on wet blending. So one of the mistakes that I've seen people make with wet blending um, is, is thinking you can go from, you know, primer or, or bare plastic to some kind of paint transition in one application of paint. So you either need to do like a, you know, an overall base coat color and then start doing this or um, do two goes, well, two or more goes. I mean, you know, a, a transparent color, you might need even more than that. So I mixed all the way up to here for highlight colors. 
and I'm not really using that. I might end up going and using that in very small places, but it would have to be controlled. So I'm, I'm really not going much beyond here because I want to keep this um, cloak dark overall. Nomad Zeke points out that my face cam is frozen. Um, my frame rate is green and I'm not seeing any problems with that. So I'm not sure that the frame rate problem is on my end. Let's see, I should be able to fix this camera though. There we go. At least I hope. So yeah, it does sound like Twitch is twitchy today. So hopefully the, oh, hi Minmax Minis and friends, many raiders. Hello, I'm working on painting Elanter the Lost Elf. Um, and this is, this is kind of at the end of, of the stream because what I started with was working out the color scheme for him and talking about how to work out color schemes and in fact how to steal them because I stole it from this ad, which I think was from World Market. But I don't plan on going to buy any pillows, so really. Unless you plan on going to pillow, buy pillows, we don't need to know that. So if you're interested in more of that part, you can watch the video on demand later. But hopefully you have all been having a great afternoon. I don't know if your Twitch was going a bit squirrely for a bit, but we have found that we've had some squirreliness happening over here. Hopefully it's all there now. I did think about actually using all those dry brushes that I've been testing on the back of this cloak, but then I just started doing this web blending thing, so I guess that's not happening. Perhaps somewhere else. Because I was using them on Mystery Mini, I can't tease you about. Or that I am teasing you about? I guess I am teasing you about Mystery Mini. But I totally use some of those brushes that I've been testing for the dry brushing on the miniature that only Ron is allowed to reveal. And I usually get a lot further along with that so that Ron can reveal it. Hi, Trader Legions. Beef in the hole. All right, so I said that the light was coming from this direction and I feel like I didn't um, really reflect that on all of the folds. So I want to beef up the, the light being on this side a little more. On some of these. But then I still have to come down into shadows in the crevice. And I will just say I am not a wet blending expert. So what I would do is get this in and then if I were being persnickety, I would do things my usual way, which is I come along wherever there's lines I don't like and I get a color kind of in between them and I keep doing this until I don't see lines I don't like. So it's just a little dot dot thing. And depending on the colors or how very persnickety I'm being about it, that can take a minute. So I probably would not make you guys sit through that whole process or we won't make we won't expect him to be like 
I'm taking this to Reapercon and I want to win all the prizes level. I think there's a chunk in my paint, so sometimes I don't care, you know, if it's small enough. Sometimes you will get a chunk that's just like in the wrong place for blending. I don't think this is one of those chunks, but I just thought I would share what I do with chunks. So this is, um, I mean, I know people who talk to their dentist and get uh, old dental tools because they'll uh, dull out for the purpose of what the dentist does long before they're not useful to us. This I probably is probably a squadron tool that I bought from Hobby Town. Um, so I get something like this. So the this this kind of needle even I mean pin, it it's not as sharp a point, especially if you have it gunked up with paint. Let's see if the the clever curl one does look sharper. But I think these are even sharper than a pin. So I prefer this to a pin. And then I just try to rub the chunk off. Now, sometimes if it's a metal miniature, the chunk, I don't know if you can see it, on the ed, end of this tool, it's a little chunk. Um, but as I was saying, sometimes on metal miniature, sometimes the chunk is in the mini. Then um, there's actually like a little divot there now. I might try to smooth it out, although that risks, if you, if you can just see it, it's a little shinier there now because I've sort of buffed the paint, as it were. Um, often that hole will be so small as to be microscopic and it doesn't matter. But you can, you know, if you get one that's big enough, you can just kind of put a little drop of paint in it and then let it dry and then put another little drop of paint in it or brush on sealer and eventually fill in the divot. Like if you have, so Dark Swords, earlier miniatures, uh, like the early ones that they produced, they sculpted in the like a little hole where the eyeball was supposed to be and if you wanted to change where the eye was looking you would have to deal with that hole and that is the kind of thing so i, I would fill up larger divots if you have metal miniatures and they get little um they get this like little pockmark thing sometimes particularly bobby jackson sculpts because he likes having these big beefy cloaks and wool robes and stuff and i think what was explained to me is that the um the metal can start cooling down by the time it's reaching the edge of the mold while it's still more molten in the middle and that can cause like a little pitting thing so it's not it's not a huge problem but if you have one and you don't like the pitting of it you can do a few coats of that brush on sealer and that helps a lot the nice thing is that that means that this rarely happens on faces or places like that, I mean, filigree or detail that we really care about because it's um, related to the thick, like the thick areas are what suffers the problem. I just want to, since this is like the main point where the light is hitting this cloak, I want to beef the highlight up on this world. And then I'll be trying to keep it darker on the other folds to preserve the idea that this is a dark green. Hey, Zambies. But I am actually getting a little into the weeds on this when I said I was just roughing in the, the main highlights and stuff, but... I thought I, it would be nice to give you kind of where the process goes from here, you know, from the, the wet blend, which I do sometimes start minis that way. Um, particularly, you know, if I really want to push myself to paint brighter highlights, so I haven't painted this fold yet, um, and I don't want them super bright here, but, you know, just coming in like this, maybe even go a little brighter.
and then paint in where my dark shadow is and some of my midtones. And then I have to fix it. So this forces me to have contrast if I've decided that this is like the contrast level that I want to have. If I, if I lay stuff down like that and then let it dry and then I have to fix it, that's a way to force your contrast. It's, you can't wuss out. You can't be like, oh, well, I'm blending and now I like it. It pushes you to be like, nope, I got to correct that. Now, you can lose it while you're trying to correct it, and then you would have to reestablish it. And in fact, I would need a couple of coats. You can see that's kind of patchy. But um, it would eventually build up to be brighter like that. Piece of cloth that's like kicking up a bit more. Keep a little shadow in between them. It's cursed day off. That is a good day. Day offs are a good day. I mean, I guess unless you have to run a bunch of running errands. big on errands. I do have to do some tomorrow. But such is life. So I'm kind of doing the less extreme version of that here. So I've added these highlights and it is not smooth and pretty. It's not like terrible. You know, if we zoom out, it's not like as rough as this but that's kind of the the ronda way of doing this but if you if you're wimping out on something like this doing it this way or working up from the darkest color or whatever um you know put put some bright highlights on there and make it a problem that you have to solve This is, of course, a more forgiving process in some colors than in others. But because this is not a super transparent saturated green, it's a pretty good color for it. No, and then things I always forget to say, I have not thinned my paint. Um, there was a time when I would have had to thin my paint more to do this, but uh, the wet blending in particular is going to go more successfully with uh, unthinned paint. And then for the benefit of people who came in a bit later, I'm going to review the colors I'm using. So um, the main color is ancient oak, but I kind of wanted this cloak a little darker. So I mixed the ancient oak with blue liner. Then the blue liner is my darkest shadow. And then I'm mixing, um, Medusa green into the ancient oak for the highlights. And that is to simulate the color of my color scheme from this pillow. Cause I stole this color scheme. Hey Corpria. Have you been here the whole time? I don't think you've been here the whole time. And Curse has to do groceries. Yeah, I think I've been putting that one off too. But the first thing I have to do is go to the post office. I tried to go on Saturday and I forgot that their hours are not as extensive on Saturday. So I got there and too bad for me. There was nobody else there. tomorrow so I think I'll be able to do that tomorrow and I will be also be having what I assume is a very routine and boring medical test I'm getting an ultrasound on my carotid artery maybe uh, Corpria can tell us if we just have one carotid artery or do we have two I don't even know 
but I'm assuming it can't take very long to ultrasound a neck. Then I can scamper off to the post office. But that was some weeks ago. I think it was I actually the, the week I had to cancel the show. Um, I had had a weird vision thing happen on Friday. And when I called my eye doctor's office, all of the doctors had gone home, but they set me up with an appointment for Monday. So I went in Monday and they did like a whole bunch of tests and they said, pretty sure everything's fine. It was just a, they call it an ocular migraine. Um, but they, they wanted me to go to my regular doctor and then the regular doctor wanted to do this test just to rule out the possibility that it could be anything else. And like nothing weird has happened since then. So I'm pretty confident that it is just going to be an expense that I can be annoyed about later instead of being a necessary thing, but I don't like to me mess with the eyes. Oh, Corporea is telling us that there are four carotid arteries. What? How does that work? I'm going to have to look up a diagram. So, wow, I guess this test is going to take longer than I think. I have to scan my whole neck or something. Internal, external on both sides. Okay. Probably shouldn't wear a turtleneck to this, I guess. That'll just make their job harder. Actually, I don't like turtlenecks. Mock turtleneck is okay, but I don't like things touching me. My husband thinks I'm nuts. We just bought him like six new turtlenecks. When the package arrived, I told him his Steve Jobs costume came in. I think that's why he likes the turtlenecks. So yes, in case anyone has been wondering how I get my smooth blends, I do this for like a while. A long while. Depending on how awesome I want it to look. And honestly, it's still a little stripey in places down here. But I may have to decide whether I care or not. But this is the secret. Insanity. Insanity is the secret. I need to bring back a little of this darker green over here. Corporea says she thinks they will just scan the external arteries. Well, I don't know which ones would cut off the blood supply to your brain, which is like, or your eyes, I assume is what they're checking for. Which I have done once. It's surprising I didn't need to take cough drop today, but I have coughed hard enough that I passed out. And no one scanned anything that time, but there you go. I bet I'm past time, aren't I? Yes, I am. All right, I probably need to stop fussing on this one blend for the rest of our lives. I do have concerns that I need to bring back some of the darker green on this side still. And then of course, when I do that, it messes up the, the blend and I have to fiddle some more, but that is part of the process for me. Once I get the initial thing down, Let's bring this up just a little more. And then I will say a good day to you all. I'm going to assume that Quindy will find you a fun raid of something else you can 
watch and listen to while you do various other things. And there's kind of, it's kind of like you can see the steps. There's like really rough, kind of rough, much less rough. But I will continue working on him next week. Maybe I'll, I'll try and go for a little uh, less blendy so that I can get further along because the cloak is just step one. And really, I was supposed to be working on the inside of the cloak. I'm very uh, distracted. Corporea wants to know why her flame craft Kickstarter hasn't arrived yet. And I want to know that too because that is like the cutest thing ever. And I'm, I'm very rarely impatient about Kickstarters and stuff. Like usually... If I order something or I back a Kickstarter or whatever, I just like wander off and forget about it. And then one day it shows up and that's very nice. Or like even, you know, there's a cliffhanger in your favorite show and then you got to wait till next season. But, but Flamecraft, I, I don't want to wait for it. That was not as bad as it sounded. So thank you all for hanging out with me. I hope the color thing wasn't like completely numbingly boring. Um, I do think it's important to think about stuff like that. And that's one of the, one of the reasons I was excited about doing this show is there's a lot of stuff that there just really isn't time to cover in two hours at a convention class. And, and this gives me the opportunity to kind of deep dive on those things sometimes. So, oh, that's a different light now. You're seeing different lights. I'm trying to get rid of all these lights, but I have yet to find the way to get this camera so that it's not full of lights. But all right, I'm going to stop talking and let Quindy find us a raid. And thank you all for joining me. I hope you'll come next week. Uh, and, and there's no mystery about next week. It's going, to, it's going to be a lantern. We'll keep trying to make him less lost than he currently is now. <laughs> and, uh, oh, and tomorrow, if you, weren't, if you didn't hear, I'm going to be on Crow's Nest with uh, Michael Proctor. And that starts at 5 p.m. Reaper time, which is central. And then there's stuff for you all, all week to enjoy. You've got Anne at 11.30 every day from Monday to Friday. And uh, Wednesday is Miniatures Den with Luca that I think it's earlier now. I think it's 1 or 1.30. I forgot to write it down. Uh, and then Thursday is Crafty Creative with um, Josh Foreman at 2. And then everybody's favorite show because you get free stuff, Reaper Live at 6. And then Friday is Reaper Land at 3 p.m. And this is not a Reaper errant weekend. Uh, Friday. <laughs>